to start off by just getting a show of hands. Has anyone ever kept bees or currently has a beehive? One person? Anyone, do you, you have a beehive now or have you kept one no. in the past? It was on loan from a beekeeper. It was, okay. Do you live in Fullerton? About a year. Do you live in Fullerton? Yes. Okay. Is anyone interested in keeping bees, potentially? Okay. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the ecology of bees, uh, how, how we fit into the picture, a little bit about colony collapse disorder, um, and uh, I'll go into a, a little bit about what we can do to help with the bee population. Um, and then I'm gonna go into uh, beekeeping on more of a hobbyist level. So there's different stages I'll go through with, with keeping hives, uh, but as far as uh, what Kent said, in Fullerton they passed a law recently where if you have a permit you can keep bees, that would be more on a hobbyist level. So I'll discuss beekeeping on that sort of a level, uh, which I think anyone can do pretty much uh, if you have the, the land. Um, I'll talk a little bit about honey, how we extract it, um, and then I'll have some time for questions and answers. And then I have some, some slides here where we can kind of look at the queens. Um, if, this is fairly informal, so if anybody has any questions, you guys can raise your hand and, and ask as we go along. But I'll also have a, a time at the end for questions and answers. I'm not going to dive into more of the complicated aspects, splitting beehives or treating pathogens, um, the business of beekeeping too much, unless you guys have specific questions. So um, again, fairly informal, and I'm going to kind of keep it a bit basic. So um, just a few facts here first off. Oh, so I'm going to start with a video. If anyone can tell me what's going on here. They're fighting. So just in the beginning, I'll play it again. Just these two bees in the beginning. If anyone can tell me what's happening there. Got hands up. <laughs> Go ahead. They're sharing honey? Right. So what one bee is doing is coming back to the hive. He's pretty much full of honey and, and basically in a way he's regurgitating honey to the other bee and that bee is then going to deposit it into a cell in the hive. So this kind of what I'm getting at here is bees are, are a pretty amazing insect. They're um, pr one of the only insects that has a cast system and they basically work in a joint effort to survive. Um, Pretty, it's a pretty amazing process once you kind of get into it. So uh, just a, a few facts here about beekeeping and honeybees. Um, this is a profession that's thousands of year old, years old. People have been doing it for thousands of years. Honey has sort of an indefinite shelf life, so it's not going to spoil. Um, the United States is one of the top five producers of honey in the world. We have uh, quite a few beekeepers, about 120,000 beekeepers in our country, and a little bit over two and a half million beehives that are actively producing honey as of five years ago. Um, I kind of mentioned the different uh, levels of beekeeping. We have commercial beekeepers, so if you have over 300 beehives or colonies, you're considered a commercial beekeeper. We have what are called sideliners or part-time beekeepers, which have about 25 to 300 hives. And then we have what are called hobbyist beekeepers, which is what most people are doing now uh, in urban environments. So this is anywhere from one to 25 beehives. And I'm gonna kind of talk a little bit more about that. Um, in a beehive itself, there can be up to 80,000 bees at a, at a certain point. Uh, we see that the populations of bees fluctuate through the year. Usually in the early summer months in Southern California, we have the most bees. And in a very productive hive, there can be quite a few. So honeybees, the, the actual scientific name is Apis mellifera. They're not native to the United States. Honeybees actually came from Europe, and they're also honeybees that were taken from Africa. They were taken by humans. Um, African bees were actually taken into South America, made their way up through Central America and into the southern uh, southwest U.S., and that's where we get Africanized bees, or in other words, what the media calls killer bees. I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, but they're not native to the United States. There's a number of other insects that are pollinators other than honeybees that are native, and uh, I'll, I'll discuss that a little bit later as well. One misconception is that uh, a lot of people think that bees are good for honey, but bees are actually better as pollinators. Um, 
The honeybee is the, the single most frequent visitor to naturally occurring flowers in the United States. They did a study, I think that was published last year on that, um, and it wasn't even close. Honeybees definitely pollinate um, quite a bit. A lot of our food comes from bees, so you've probably heard about a third of all the food that we eat is due to bees pollinating different agricultural crops. Um, and then about three quarters of, of flowering plants are pollinated by bees. You can see down here, I just listed a few. This isn't, this isn't all of the, the crops, but a lot of these are very, very dependent. Almonds in particular are 100% dependent on bees to get pollination. So without bees, a lot of things you know, we wouldn't have. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the different bees. There's basically three bees in a hive. Uh, the first I'm going to talk discuss here, which is the most important, is the queen. The queen lives the longest. She can live about two to five years. Here you see a queen right here that we have marked. There's a universal marking system for queens. Uh, different uh, people breed queens and will mark them so they're easier to find in the beehive. Um, this particular color we we bred this bee this year, so green signifies a year ending in nine. Uh, so this is a 2019 uh, queen that we bred earlier this spring. Um, they basically all a queen does is produces eggs and releases pheromones in the hive um, so the bees can communicate. A queen can lay up to 2,000 eggs a day, so they can be very productive. And there's really only one queen per hive most of the time. Um, a queen, if a, another queen is introduced, the queen will, will find that new queen and kill it right away. Um, in rare instances, we can have two queens that are symbiotic, but that's pretty extremely rare. Um, the queen can sting, but it's very rare for her to sting a beekeeper. I, I've never actually even heard of that. Um, she pretty much just will sting another queen if, if she's introduced. Now, when you say you bred the queen, what's involved in getting, quote, the queen? Um, I'm going to go into that in a little bit. Oh, okay. So I'll, I'll discuss that. Okay. Um, but th that's a good question. I'll, I'll, I'll be discussing that. So the next bee we have in the hive is the drone. So drones are the only males in the beehive. Um, their lifespan is pretty much dependent on the hive. A drone really doesn't do any sort of work in the hive. All the drone does is mate with the queen um, and basically take up space in the hive. So there's not too many drones in a beehive. I would say somewhere, depending on the, the hive, maybe between 100 and 1,000 drones at any time during the year. Uh, what will happen is as food stores go down, as, as honey production goes down, the, the queens basically get kicked out of the hive by the, the female worker bees. Um, so towards the end of the year, when there's a little bit less honey available, the numbers of, of drones go down significantly. And in turn, there's less bees being bred. Um, they're a little bit different looking. They have larger eyes, a larger head, and a rounded body. Uh, I'll, I'll try to point some out in, in a moment here. Um, and that kind of takes, and they have no stinger. So uh, a drone is the only bee in a hive that can't sting. Um, this is a little bit difficult to see here, but there's a drone right here. So the body's a little bit bigger, the eyes are a little bit bigger on the head, and then you can see another drone right here. So the body's a little bit more rounded. The rest of the bees in this picture are worker bees. So worker bees, I'm going to go to them next. They have about a, a six-week lifespan. Uh, they're basically doing all the work in the hive other than, than laying the eggs. Um, there's sort of a caste system when it comes to worker bees. So younger bees usually spend about the first 20 days of their life in the hive, uh, helping to build wax comb, taking care of the queen, um, keep cleaning out the cells, maintaining the, the temperature inside of the hive, which is usually maintained in the mid 90s. Um, and then eventually working their, working their way up to become guard bees, where they're guarding the front entrance of the hive. Uh, and then after that, they can become foragers, where they're out collecting food and water for the hive. Uh, queen bee, or sorry, worker bees also have baskets on their legs where they're able to collect pollen um, from, from different flowering plants. They can lay eggs, but they're not fertilized like a queen is. So when they lay an egg, it's going to turn into a drone. Um, and one of the, I'll go into this later as well, but one of the issues that you'll see with a beehive if you're starting 
is at some point you won't have a queen and you may see that there's evidence of a, a worker that's laying eggs. Um, that's sort of a red flag and would need to be addressed right away. Questions? Yeah. And also, where's like the leaf curve bee and bumblebee? So those are other types of, of pollinators. Some of those bees are not social the way that honeybees are. They're more independent. So those are different different species of bees. Those are, a lot of those bees, though, are native to the United States. So bees go through what's called uh, metamorphosism. So this is basically four stages that they go through. Every single bee starts as an egg, then becomes a larva, develops into what's called a pupa, and then emerges as an adult. Uh, the, the different stages vary. So our queens uh, go from egg to adult the quickest. It takes about 16 days. Workers take about 21 days, and then drones take about 24 days. Any egg inside of a beehive can potentially become a queen. Uh, what the bees end up doing is feeding that egg more royal jelly and building her up, enlarging her cell, and then that, that can develop into a queen. And I'll go into that more in a moment as well. Uh, but this is sort of that caste system that I'm, I'm talking about. The eggs look like a small little uh, grain of rice uh, as they're developing, and then as a larvae, they look like little white, shiny, um, uh, like, kind of like a larvae, but just white and shiny. And then once it becomes the pupa stage, they're capped. We call it capped brood. The different cells of these are all different sizes. So our worker is going to be the smallest, drone cells are a little bit bigger, and then the queen cell is going to be the biggest. So colony collapse disorder, this was polarized by the media about 10 or 15 years ago uh, with beekeepers. Beekeepers were seeing losses of up to 50% of their beehives through the year. Um, that kind of continued on and really is still ongoing. We don't fully understand it. Now I, I think it's been a bit better. Uh, with our beehives, I think we're seeing more of closer to about a 20% loss um, through the wintertime. And that's actually better for us because we're in Southern California where there's more, more of a mild climate, there's more flowering sources. But once you get into areas of the Midwest, other parts of the United States, that percentage is still pretty high. Uh, there's a lot of different factors that play into this. One concern is pesticide usage. Uh, neonicotinoids are a common, or were a common pesticide that were used on different agricultural crops. Uh, the FDA is, is starting to address that a little bit more now. Monocultures, so a lot of commercial beekeepers will take their beehives across the country and the bees will end up pollinating basically just one crop. That's been a, a little bit of an issue. Poor nutritional sources, some beekeepers will supplement their beehives with pollen that has GMOs or basically raw sugar so that they're not going out and, and foraging to get natural uh, nectar or pollen. Uh, and then new pathogens. There's a lot of different pathogens that, as beekeepers, we're always struggling to deal with. Uh, the biggest being Varroa. This is a mite that uh, basically infects the hive. Uh, when the hives, if you look at the hive as sort of an immune system, when that immune system is lower, that Varroa becomes a problem. Um, I mentioned commercial travel and stress as an issue. Habitat loss. So growing urban areas, taking away agricultural areas where, where hives are kept, and then climate change. A lot of queens come from different parts of the country. Uh, a lot of them are from Northern California, um, or even some from Europe, and they're not able to adapt to some of the climate changes that we're seeing. So uh, I mentioned earlier that the domestic honeybee is not native uh, to the United States. And, and really, colony collapse disorder is a syndrome, so we, we still don't understand it. It was never fully understood before, um, and it really is, is going to take a lot more time, I think, for us to, to really understand that. Other pollinators are still important. You mentioned a bumblebee or a carpenter bee. Uh, there's moths, wasps, a lot of different insects will pollinate. And one of the things we need to do is to further investigate how honeybees impact the ecology and, and dynamic of, of these other native plants uh, and pollinators. So more studies still need to be done in order for us to understand this a bit more. So what can we do to help? Urban environments are really the best for bees. Uh, the reason for that is because there's less pesticide use. When we take bees out into rural environments where there's agriculture, there's lots of pesticide use up there. 
in, in urban environments, it's much less. There's also much more flowers. People plant flowers in their yards, they water their yards. There's usually a regular water source and flower source for bees to go to. Bees, bees can travel up to a few miles, but if there's a source in front of them, they're not going to waste or expend their energy doing that. They're going to go to the closest source. So really, these types of environments, Fullerton, Orange County, is really a great place for bees. Uh, planting diverse flowers in your yard definitely helps nectar and pollen sources. If you see a swarm or a hive, you have a hive in your house, the best thing to do is to call a beekeeper rather than an exterminator. Beekeepers can most of the time go out, save that, or catch it, relocate it, and hopefully save it at that point. Uh, and usually experienced beekeepers are able to recognize right away whether there's any sort of disease or if the queen is aggressive, anything like that. This is a swarm that we had in one of our, our yards where we were keeping bees uh, way up in the tree. This was a huge swarm this spring. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, providing water sources for bees is a, is a great way to help them. So I'm not talking about pools or hot tubs, spas, anything like that, but having fountains out, moss with water, kind of soaked moss, things like that are really, really good for bees. Um, Avoiding any pesticide and chemical uses on your, on your flowers at your house will help. Um, purchasing honey from uh, bee, local beekeepers or basically raw honey significantly helps. A lot of the honey in the United States is not domestic, it's imported, and unfortunately it's tainted. Um, and those don't, don't come from beekeepers, those come from packers. Uh, I'll go into that a little bit later as well, but there's a lot of issues that come up with that. And then what I think is one of the biggest things is responsible beehive management. So basically the public having beehives now, a lot of cities are, are approving this, is helping, but it's just not a matter of getting a beehive, putting it in your yard, and leaving it. Fullerton actually has uh, a, a pretty descriptive, uh, on their website, pretty good description on what you actually have to do to manage your hive. You can't just put a beehive in your yard and then, and then let it be. There's issues that come about with that. Beehives can swarm, and if they're aggressive, that perpetuates. They can have disease, they can swarm, and then they can transfer that disease to other hives. So it's really a matter of making sure that you're at least read up a little bit. Maybe somebody's helping you. Um, but responsible beehive management goes a long way. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about keeping hives here locally. There's, there's a couple of ways that you can start a hive if you're interested. Uh, one way is from a swarm. So basically you catch a swarm, which I, if you've never you know, kept bees, I wouldn't recommend going after something like this. <laughs> it's just not worth it. Um, but catching a swarm is one way. Rescuing an existing hive from somebody's house is another way. Again, I wouldn't suggest that. Uh, the next two things I would recommend though is getting a, purchasing a package of bees or purchasing what's called a nucleus colony. This is one of our beekeepers here. He's holding what's called a nucleus colony. And this has about five frames of uh, bees in it with one queen. Uh, this is sort of like a starter hive in a way before it develops into one of the larger hives. Uh, that's a good way. These packages are small boxes that come with about two to 3,000 bees in them with one queen. And those, those are eventually transferred into a beehive um, and then from there it, it grows. Uh, and then you can also purchase the hive outright, which I think for a beginner, I, I wouldn't necessarily suggest it because those bees are already full blown working and, and you really gotta get to work right away. Uh, one of these other two options, you have some time to kind of give them a, a few weeks in between inspections, kind of step back and see what you're doing. You're doing the right thing. How much does a nucleus colony cost? I think that, that depends on the, what beekeeper you're going to. We, our company sells nucleus colonies for about $250. Um, I think it varies from around two to $300 in general. These are difficult to ship though. So you'd, you'd have to find a beekeeper locally that's willing to give that to you. Packages usually ship. So a lot of those come from Northern California and they overnight them. So our equipment, Ambrose, my nephew here is going to help me a little bit. He's going to kind of come around and show some equipment. Um, my son was also running around here with his bee suit on, but a couple of uh, big things. Protective equipment is totally important here. We have, this is Natalie, one of our beekeepers. She's got a veil, a suit, gloves, uh, her smoker, 
and then you need a, a good set of shoes. The hive tool is one of the most important things. So our hive tool is, you know, I have a couple up here. This is a hive tool that is probably the beekeeper's favorite tool. You can go around and show that if you want. Um, that's used to open the top cover of the beehive, move the frames around, pretty much for anything. Our, our smoker, you have to have a smoker. So this is an example of a smoker here. Uh, you can use burlap, pine needles, different sorts of fuel are made for that. Um, but we definitely need that to sort of calm the bees. We're not uh, sedating the bees or stunning the bees with that. All it's doing is uh, the bees are unable to communicate when they're smoked. So they can't tell each other that there's an intruder. Let's go, you know, go after them. Uh, but I can, I can say after beekeeping for about 10 years that bees in general are not very aggressive. There are aggressive uh, Africanized bees here in Southern California. And after beekeeping for a while, you can recognize it. But generally, bees are not aggressive. And if you know when to go check the hives at the right time, a lot of times you're, you're using little to no smoke. Um, picking a good location is very important. So you want to be a good neighbor. Make sure you let your neighbors know. Uh, it wouldn't be a good idea to put beehives next to a pool, or if you had a next door neighbor that had a pool, bees are attracted to chlorine. Um, and in the summertime when it gets warm, they're definitely going to be having bees visiting them. Uh, you would want to face your hive away from prevailing winds, and you don't want to face it directly into the sun and the heat of the day. So the best way to do that is to try to find an area where you can face your hives to the east, and so that the afternoon sun is, is hitting the back side of the hive. Can you, can you explain how the bees control the temperature of the hive? Yeah, so inside the beehive, I, I had mentioned it's about <coughs> mid-90s or so. Bees collect something called propolis, which they use to seal the entire hive. In fact, somebody once told me that the inside of a beehive is more sterile than a human hospital. Um, and I, you know, I, I could see that, it's totally sealed. In, in some cases, if you go too long without checking your hive, it's, it really takes some work with the hive tool to get the top off. Um, but they control it by, by beating their wings. And they, they also beat their wings to evaporate some of the nectar to create the honey. I'll talk about that. But by beating their wings, they can fluctuate the temperature of the hive. And if it's too hot, like in the middle of the summer, a lot of them will start coming out of the front of the hive um, and, and start cooling. We call it a bee beard, where in front of the hive, you see this cluster of three, three to 5,000 bees right here. And what they're doing is trying to cool the hive down. In the middle of the winter, especially in the, the Midwest states, the numbers of bees go way, way down and they create this small little cluster and just constantly beat their wings to keep it warm. So one of the reasons for that is if it gets too hot, the wax inside there will melt. So they have to, to cool that. Did I answer your question there? Yeah. Okay. And the last thing here, if, if this is just my suggestion. Um, from my experience, but I would not suggest having more than four hives per half acre. Um, unless you have rural area around you, once you start getting up above four with that sort of a property, um, it does tend to become a little bit of a nuisance for some of the, the neighbors. And then, of course, know your city's ordinances. All cities are different. Um, beekeeping is regulated by cities. Yeah. If you have um, a swarm that's uh, extremely aggressive, do you destroy them? No. We, uh, we actually breed our own queens, so we, we breed gentle queens. So we'll go into that hive after we've saved them, and we'll actually kill the queen, and then we'll, we'll replace it with a new queen that's gentle. That's gentle. Yeah. So, and that, so the hive is aggressive, it's the queen, it's not... It's the, the, queen is, is the queen and the drones are giving all of the genetics to the hive. So it, it's basically once that queen is killed, it takes about six weeks for, these, for the bees to, to turn over, basically. So after about a month and a half, the hive should be significantly more gentle. There's been very few instances where we actually had to euthanize a hive. In fact, I can... One time? Yeah, one time we've had to do that. Um, and that's because we weren't able to requeen it. They were just too aggressive for us to go into. How do you determine aggressiveness? Uh, bees will, they'll release a pheromone when you go into a hive, it sort of smells like banana. 
and you can instantly smell that, but really they're, they're going to be pinging off of you, trying to sting you right away. Uh, when you go to the hive and then walk away from the hive, they'll follow you. Um, those are usually signs of aggression. Uh, bees that are not aggressive will pretty much not even care that you're in the hive. So one of the things that's important with beekeeping is going in the hive at the right time. If there's inclement weather, if it's windy or it's cloudy or it's rainy, bees, more bees will be in the hive. They're going to be a little bit more upset when you go in. Um, as well as if you were to go in later in the day or really early in the morning when there's still a lot of bees, they're going to be a bit more aggressive. Uh, and if they are like that, the best thing is just to close them up and then come back in the middle of the day, preferably on a sunny day. Um, and then you can actually test the temperament that way. You have a question, Richard? Why do bees sting? Why do bees sting? Bees to defend their hive. But when some bees, when they sting, they die. All bees sting, uh, all bees that sting will die except for the queen. She won't die when she stings. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that uh, the workers are able to lay eggs. Uh-huh. Um, would, would they like, just pull themselves in because they're not being? They're, they, they lay unfertilized eggs, so they're gonna, whatever they lay, it's gonna turn into a drone, a male bee. So what would they, that have to take back some genetics as a worker? Yeah, okay. yeah, the same, that same line will stay in there. So this is kind of a, a basic hive setup. This is called a Langstroth hive. This is what's most commonly used in the United States. This was adapted from some European bee hives. And there are a number of different types of hives out now. I would suggest as a starting beekeeper, to go with a Langstroth hive. And the reason for that is you can do a lot of manipulations within the hive. Most equipment is available with this sort of a, a hive setup. Um, but what you can see here, we have a, what's called a top cover, which is the top of the beehive. An inner cover, which is not used too much in the, the southern US. This is used to, to leave a gap on top of the frames to place things like pollen. Um, because we have so much flora available for bees, we're not having to supplement as much with pollen uh, at least in Southern California, but that's the, the next thing. Then we have what's called a super. That's what this box is here. And this is filled with frames. Um, usually the upper super is gonna be filled with honey. Uh, and those frames are gonna be a bit smaller, like this here. You can walk around with that if you want. So this would be called a, that would be in what's called a honey super. Uh, below that we would have something called a queen excluder. This is actually keeping the queen down in this box to lay eggs so that she's not laying eggs up where the honey is. And then we have a, a lower super, or what's called a brood chamber or a brood box. This is where all the, lay, the eggs and the larvae are. And then we have a bottom board. In Southern California, it gets very hot. So we have bottom boards that are just solid wood, or you can buy a bottom board with a screen. And bottom boards with screens, I, 100% of the time I would recommend it here because it gets warm. It also ventilates the hive more so there's less, uh, less pickup of pathogens that way. So this first point here is my suggestion um, and that's if, if you're beginning with a beehive, I started with one hive and then eventually it turned into three hives. But it's difficult to manage one hive. And as, a, as an early beekeeper, you're going to run into problems. Your queen is going to die at some point. It, it's inevitable. Um, and having more than one hive is advantageous in that if the queen has, is gone or if you have a queenless hive for some reason, you can move eggs from one hive to the next um, and help basically help that hive survive. Uh, the other thing that, that, that's beneficial by having a few hives is that you can see the differences between the temperaments of the bees, how productive the queen is, and you actually learn much faster that way. So I, I don't think that just having one hive, I, I actually think having two to maybe three hives is, is advantageous. There are seasonal changes with bees. This is very important to know if you're going to be beekeeping. So in the spring, we see the, the population of the bees skyrocket. Pretty much March, April, May, the numbers are going up. And bees are naturally wanting to swarm. It's a natural process with bees. If you were to put a beehive in your yard in January and not check it until March or April, I can guarantee you it will already have swarmed at least twice. So you really need to be on top of it in the spring, checking for swarming. In the summer, the honey yield increases a bit, so, so bees are bringing more nectar back to the hive. So you need to make sure that you're 
uh, checking that regularly, making sure that you don't need to add more room for the bees to deposit honey. Ants can become a bit of a problem in Southern California in the summer. Uh, in the fall, this is a, a time when the, the numbers of bees decrease rapidly and we see an increase in some of these pathogens. So for example, the varroa mites increase in the fall with the decrease in the, the number of bees in the hive. And then in the winter, we see kind of a, a drop off and then a very quick, rapid increase, typically in January in Southern California. There's more drones being made at that time. There's more, that means there's more drones mating with queens and there's more eggs being laid. Uh, always having a water source is very important. You want to make sure if you're going to be keeping beehives that you want to have some sort of water source for them. One, so that you know, they need that for their hive, but so that they're not going to your neighbor's house and, and bothering them. Um, feed when necessary and treat when necessary. This is a very controversial topic with beekeepers. I won't really go into that too much. Um, I will say that it's best if bees can, can forage themselves and if you can recognize starvation or, or if their pollen and honey counts are low, then that's time to feed them depending on what time of the year it is. And then treat when necessary if you have an overwhelming uh, mite issue or it looks like you know, the, the hive will perish, at that, at that point it's time to treat them. A lot of beekeepers will prophylactically treat their bees with antibiotics or different pesticides. Uh, and, and that's why I say it's very controversial because there's concern that some of that residue can get into the honey. Two years ago, the FDA, uh, I'm sorry, the, the California Department of Food and Agriculture passed a law that beekeepers now actually have to obtain a prescription from a veterinarian uh, to use antibiotics on their hive. Whether that's being followed so far is, I can tell you from my experience, it's not, but some beekeepers are doing it, so that's hopeful. The last thing on here is very important. Always leave enough honey for the colony. I've made that mistake in the past. You see honey starting to develop, you get excited, you pull the honey off, and then all of a sudden the bees have nothing to eat. Um, so you only take the surplus. Going back to this picture here, bees will put honey down in this lower chamber, but really that's for them. You don't want to touch that honey. If there's a surplus of honey up here, you can take it. You want to make, we want to remember basically bees are making honey so that they can eat it and then they're storing it to eat it over the winter. So if you're taking everything in the fall and they're just left with a tiny bit of honey in here, they're going to perish over the winter. They're going to starve. Excuse me. In the winter time, do bees uh, quote hibernate or how far latitude wise do they survive the winter and how? That's a good question. So in Southern California, they don't hibernate. And I guess you can call it hibernating in parts of the country. In, in parts of the country where it freezes and there's snow, the bees will stay in the hive and come out once or twice the entire winter just to do, they like, kind of basically stretch their wings and then come back into the hive. It looks like a swarm and then they come right back. Uh, but they stay clustered to keep that hive warm uh, pretty much the whole winter. So the beekeeping in Minnesota is, is completely different than beekeeping in Southern California. It's such an advantage for us here because we have such a mild climate and we can actually get honey year round here in some cases. Um, last winter, we actually had a very wet winter and there was a lot of, of flora through the winter and spring and we were almost getting honey year round because of that. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the queen I think you asked a question earlier about uh, some queen breeding. Um, I'm not going to go too much into queen breeding, but the queen is one of the most important aspects as far as the health of the hive. So if you have a healthy queen, you're most likely going to have a healthy hive. The queen's going to dictate the temperament of the hive, how productive the hive is. So are they going to be producing a lot of honey, a lot of pollen? Are they going to be poll good pollinators? And how resistant are they to pathogens? There's a lot of queens that are being bred now that are being bred with certain genetic traits where they, they're resistant to mites. Uh, one, other, one other concerning thing with, with some queens I had mentioned as well, a lot of these queens come from different parts of the country and they're not necessarily adapted to the weather in Southern California. So you have to keep that in, in mind a bit. Um, we breed queens here in, in actually Fullerton and Yorba Linda, and these are examples of what are called queen cells. So these cells are much bigger. Uh, this is one of our beekeepers checking the queen cells. And in the picture here, you can see the queen. She's actually surrounded by what are called nurse bees. 
These are very young worker bees that are just kind of making sure she has everything that she needs. Where she's going to lay the egg is the cell queen cleaning up after her. Um, but there is the issue if you buy queens from Southern California breeders that we have Africanized genes. And so you want to make sure it's from a, a reputable breeder that's not going to give you an aggressive queen right off the bat. Yeah? Doesn't the hive breed its own queens when necessary? Yeah, so when bees swarm naturally, what they're doing is, and I think I have a picture of this coming up, but they're all of a sudden, you're, you're going to look in the hive and see all of these cells here. And what the, what the hive is going to do, if they're about to do, is that half of the hive is about to take off with that queen. And what they're going to do then is, is try to create their own queen. So any, like I mentioned earlier, any queen can be made from an egg. The bees will choose to do that. So once the queen leaves and swarms with the hive, the remaining bees are going to try to raise their own queen. And they, and they can raise their own queen. Uh, the concern there, though, is that we don't know the temperament of the queen, um, different issues like that. In the, in the springtime when that's happening, that's actually a good time as you get more experience with beekeeping to do what's called splitting your hive. You can actually divide it and make two hives at that point because of these excess queen cells that they're making. Question here in the front. Um, yeah. Up until a couple of years ago, we'd get uh, a swarm maybe once a year with all the beekeeper out here and take them. The last couple of years, what I've noticed is are individual bees in distress. You know, either they uh, can't fly uh -huh. or they be on their backs, which is, you know, is there something going around that affects them? Yeah, there's something called the form wing virus, which is a virus they can have that can, they have smaller wings and they have difficulty flying. But I think what you might be referring to, a lot of bees that get into pesticides will become what's called ataxic or have difficulty walking like they're uncoordinated, almost like they're drunk, and they have difficulty flying. So if you, you see bees on the ground that are kind of just flailing around, unable to fly, a lot of times that's because there was some sort of pesticide that they got into. And what bees do is when they find a good food source, they come back to the hive and tell the other bees in the hive where that's at. Uh, unfortunately, if they found a source where the tree had just been sprayed, all of the bees will go to that tree and come back, and then all of a sudden all of the bees are affected by the pesticide. Most pesticides will cause neurological changes to the bees, and that's why we see them kind of acting like that. So it could have been that maybe somebody in the neighborhood has been spraying, and, th and that's why you're seeing that. This is just a, an example. I, I apologize. I had some better videos, but I, I hadn't uploaded them correctly. Um, so I, last minute we just threw in some videos. But this is a beehive that's pretty strong. You can see how many bees are um, moving around here. Oops. So it, it does get pretty busy. The bottom entrance of this is completely open. The problem with that, if you have a, a more immature hive, say with just one or two boxes, is that other bees will see that and come in there and then try to rob their honey. And that will create some aggression. With a more uh, mature beehive, like this one, uh, you can leave it open and they're able to def defend themselves because their population is so high. So doing hive inspections. If you have a beehive, this is basically what you're gonna be doing about every three to six weeks. And there's a few key things that you're looking for when you inspect your hive. So what you're going to be looking for are any evidence of swarm cells. Uh, swarm cells being those, those larger queen cells that I pointed out. You can have what are called supersedure cells, which are swarm cells rather than being on the bottom of the frame, are actually within the middle part of the frame. So most, most bees will, will swarm and put their queen cells or swarm cells on the bottom here. If you see a few cells in the middle of the, the hive, that means that the queen suddenly for some reason died, and now they're trying to supersede her. The, queens are, the, the bees are trying to make a new queen. Um, but you're checking for that. You're checking for the, their pollen and honey stores. So in the early summer, late spring, they're filling it with more honey. It's time to put more, more boxes or supers on top of it. Otherwise, they are going to swarm. Um, and then as you get more experience, you, you really are, are checking the brood pattern. Of, of the hive, and that's going to kind of dictate how much of a, a pathogen problem or a parasite problem they have. Um, 
A lot of early beekeepers will get hung up on trying to find the queen every time you're checking the beehive, and that's not totally necessary. It's pretty cool to find the queen, but what you're looking for is evidence of the queen. So if you're seeing eggs in each cell, um, you're seeing a good brood pattern, you know that there's a queen in the hive that's laying and she's healthy. So this is an example of a nucleus colony. Um, we make these, what we do is when we split a beehive, we make them into a nucleus and then build them up into a, one of these bigger boxes. But uh, these can become pretty active as well, going in and out of the entrance there. So this is an example of a good brood pattern right here. So these are all capped uh, pupa inside the hive. That's an excellent brood pattern. That's evidence that there's a very strong laying queen in this hive. Um, here you can actually see swarm cells. So this is a hive that we had this spring that was swarming. All of these are, are queen cells on the bottom. So this, this hive is getting ready to swarm very quickly. Uh, well, I had a video of this, but what we ended up doing is splitting this hive into a number of hives and we actually cut these swarm cells off and then place them into a new hive uh, that, that was queenless, and we were able to propagate them that way. So what you're looking for is a good brood pattern. Um, you're looking at the numbers of bees in the hive. So if the numbers of bees in the hive is, is dropping, that's a concern. You're looking at their pollen and honey stores, and then you're looking at the eggs directly, um, the larvae directly, and then if you can, trying to find the queen. But again, that, that can take a long time, especially as an amateur beekeeper. The problems that we're looking at or we're faced with, these are some of the pathogens. So Varroa mite is the most common. Something called American fowl brood, which is a bacterial disease that is regulated now by the USDA because of how problematic it is. We don't really see much of that in Southern California. I've, I've been beekeeping for 10 years and I've never actually had it luckily in any of my hives. Uh, what's more common is something called European fowl brood in the United States. Uh, tracheal mites, hive beetles, and wax moths can all become a problem. Starvation, so this is a, a bit more common in the fall. If uh, it gets really dry, there's not a lot of pollen sources, bees can starve, and at that point you really need to be feeding your bees, otherwise they will perish. Uh, swarming, I, I went over that. And then a queenless colony, sometimes you, you go into your hive, you can't find the queen, there's no eggs. Or maybe you see that there's multiple eggs in each cell. That's usually evidence of a laying worker. At that time, it, it, it's, you want to try to order a queen. Um, or if, if you have the, the luxury of having two to three hives, you can move a frame of eggs into that hive, and hopefully they'll raise their own queen. Pesticide kill. So again, I, I went over that. If, if bees are going to a source, the whole hive is going to go there, and then the, the hive can perish. And then Africanized bees are a problem. Africanized bees, really, the beekeeper that's coming out to rescue a hive or a swarm really needs to be aware uh, of the temperament of the bees and able to requeen them. Otherwise, this is going to uh, perpetuate the problem uh, of aggression in the bees. Um, but Africanized bees are, are still continually a problem here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about honey. Uh, we brought some honey today. My father's over there. He's going to, if you guys would like to sample some of the honey, we have it here. Um, but uh, what happens here, uh, this is a, a pretty good example of a very mature beehive. You can see these are our brood chambers here on the bottom. So that's where the queen is doing all of her work. Here's our queen excluder. And then on top, we have our honey supers. So there's, there's uh, frames of honey up here. What happens is bees will deposit honey in these little cells. So bee, a bee goes to a flower, they collect nectar, which has a pretty high water content. They store that in their body, they go back to the hive, regurgitate it. Before regurgitating it, it mixes with an enzyme um, that takes off some of the sugar, and uh, then they pack it in these cells. And then over time, the bees beat their wings, they evaporate off that water, and then we have honey, which is about 16% water, 16% water content or so. Once they get to that 16%, they cap it with wax. So this is a, a frame that's actually, probably has a, a bit more nectar in there, but they're beginning to cap it. And then you can see as they become a little bit more capped, looks like that. And then this is a fully capped frame of honey here. 
So this is ready to be extracted. So what we're doing here, this is the extraction process. We take that frame of capped honey and we take a hot knife. We have this right here. Um, this is actually electric. And we basically shave off those wax caffeines. A lot of beekeepers will reserve that, those wax caffeines and, uh, for wax, things like that. Uh, but we shave that off and then we put it into what's called an extractor. This is like a big centrifuge. The honey, it spins very fast. The honey goes out to the side and drains down. And then it's basically just strained through a sieve like this. And, you know, with that. and that's basically raw honey. A lot of honey can become over-processed um, or filtered. And it takes out a lot of the in inherent properties that are, are so good in raw honey. Raw honey actually has a lot of pollen. It has propolis. Sometimes it has honeycomb bits. It's all edible. And it's actually where a lot of the nutritional value uh, from honey comes. It's not pasteurized and it's not filtered. Uh, when honey's pasteurized or heated too high, it, it takes out a lot of the inherent enzymes and antioxidants that come with honey. Raw honey could be crystallized, opaque, or clear. This is an example of different types of honey. So basically these are different varieties. We, ha we have some of these here today, uh, but they all look different. And, and this is pretty incredible. They all look different based on whatever the bees are pollinating. So for example, here's orange blossom. The bees are pollinating orange trees. It creates a completely different texture, taste, aroma, and color to the honey. Compare that to something like buckwheat down here, which has a very strong molasses texture, very strong odor and taste, completely different. So I, I'd encourage you guys, if you want to taste some of this honey, and taste the difference between raw honey. Um, it, it's pretty remarkable what the bees can do. So some benefits of raw honey. There's a lot of anti-inflammatory, antibacterial, and antifungal properties. Honey's actually used quite a lot in um, human and veterinary medicine. Uh, honey is, is packed with antioxidants. It's used a lot now for as a prebiotic for gut health. Um, and then for years it's been used as a cough suppressant and a uh, soothing agent for sore throats, things like that. Raw honey definitely has a superior taste that, to, compared to honey that's processed. So honey that's filtered or overheated is gonna have sort of a generic sweet taste, uh, whereas raw honey has a very unique taste based on whatever the bees are pollinating. One of the cool things about keeping a beehive in, in Southern California, if you keep one in your house, you're basically gonna get wildflower honey. And every batch is gonna taste different because there's different flowers blooming whenever you're gonna pull that honey off. So that's kind of a, a cool aspect of it. Um, raw honey is untainted, so a lot of honey, I mentioned this earlier, is, is uh, imported into the United States. And unfortunately, uh, some of this is tainted with antibiotics. Um, there's corn syrup or cane sugar that's put into it, and it's not real honey. So really you want to make sure, you know, if you're seeing crystallized honey, that's actually a good sign. You know that it's raw and it's probably less tainted. It's coming from more of a trusted source. What's the shelf life of honey? It oh, has wow. an infinite shelf life. Infinite. Yeah. So what it's going to do at some point is it will crystallize or granulate. Um, you can always reliquify it by putting it in a warm bowl of water and it will reliquify. Uh, in Europe, they actually prefer it crystallized. So most honey is sold is sold in crystallized form. Uh, but it has an infinite shelf life. So is that why you can use it on wounds as an antibacterial? The reason that it's used on wounds is because honey has such a high sugar content that it has an osmotic effect. So when you put it over a wound where there's bacteria or fungus, it draws that out of the wound because of the osmosis there. That's the main reason that it's used in dressings. There's some kind of honey that does not crystallize from the yeah. stuff, isn't it? What is that uh, Acacia honey is, is slower to crystallize. Sage honey, which we have here today, does not regularly crystallize. And then uh, this is a good, a good point to bring up because each of these varieties all crystallize at different rates. Wildflower honey tends to crystallize very quickly. Avocado honey tends to crystallize, takes a very long time, two or three years. Um, sage honey does not crystallize, so they're all very different in, in what you're going to get. So that kind of takes me to the end here. This is a, a 
a picture. We have beehives in an organic passion fruit grove in Ontario, and this is a, they're blooming right now. Um, and we get passion fruit honey from these, which is a, it's an exceptionally tasting honey, but this is a cool photo that I like because of the, the bloom that's going on right now. You can see how pretty those passion fruits are. Um, so I have a couple other slides that I'll show in a minute, but does anybody have any other questions right now? Yeah. How can you get sage honey? I mean, can you get such a big batch of sage that, you know, all the bees that go into that batch? Yeah, I, I didn't go into what, what I do, but we have, I have a company um, and we have uh, close to 200 beehives and we move a lot of our beehives to, to get certain varieties. So we've moved beehives to Central California to get uh, coastal sage in that area. So the only area around here that we've acquired sage is in Silverado Canyon. You're not going to be able to plant enough sage in your own yard to get sage honey. <coughs> I mean, like, is it maybe only sage blooms at that time? Yes. That's yeah. You know, nothing else is blooming. So what you're doing is you're moving the beehives into an area where there's sage that's in bloom, and then the bees will go to that. Uh, it, it depends on what you're pollinating as well. So, for example, blueberries, you have to move the hives into the blueberries halfway through the bloom, and then the bees will go to it, and then um, the, they'll go to, to just those trees. Um, same thing when we go to oranges, we have to put them in right at the start of the bloom. They'll go to the orange trees. But you can't just put it in a grove of orange trees that are not blooming. They're not going to go to those. Does being moved around upset them at all? Yeah. Yeah, it does. It, uh, it's a stressor on the bees. So it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when you're going after, so you're going after local sage habitat. So are you seeking out like black specific species like a black sage or a uh -huh. sage? So our so the bees that we've had in Central California are pollinating black button sage. The bees that we've had in Silverado Canyon are just are pollinating the native sage that's up there. Ah, okay. Blooming. That usually blooms in the springtime up there. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. And another way to know that the honey is like real? Some people have been selling like stuff that are not real honey. So if you like get a bowl and pour some honey in water, and if it's just waves, that's not like, real honey. But if you get like a different one, and you get to see like those rectangle shapes, and that's like real honey. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I know a lot about honey. You have a question? Um, is there such thing as organic honey? <laughs> is that a loaded question? <laughs> um, there, there, we have organic honey, but it doesn't usually come from the United States. It gets certified from other countries and then imported into the United States. It's difficult to control where the bees go. So uh, there are, are programs now, like the non-GMO program, and the certain certifications for um, organic foods that are trying to be able to certify honey, but it's very challenging because they have to see but they have to know where the beekeepers are keeping their beehives and they have to be a certain distance from really agriculture or, or rural areas where there's a lot of heavy pesticide usage. But really, people still still spray their yards you know, in urban areas. So we, I, get, I don't think you can realistically say that honey is 100% organic. I think what's more important there is are, what kind of chemicals are you putting on your bees? Uh, how much sugar are you feeding your bees? Are your bees just going out? foraging, coming back, and then are you just taking the raw product? That's really what more organic honey should be. Um, but there may be more certifications that pop up to, to help these, these types of beekeepers. When you see swarms running around the, the neighborhood, are, are they potentially healthy? Is that a good sign of health, that they were strong enough to, to swarm? Yeah, so bees naturally swarm when the numbers of bees in their hive increase. Yeah. So that means that there's a hive nearby where you know, their, their numbers were increasing, they outgrew their home, and they had to swarm. Either that or you know, maybe that a beekeeper was not tending to the hive as regularly as they should, um, not adding boxes or, or checking it, but that's a, a total natural process. Yeah. In Southern California, it usually happens somewhere between March and I would say October, November. Uh, we were getting we were getting swarms into December last year, weren't we? That's a little rare, but 
Um, it's a total natural process. All right, and that's all I have. <laughs>